Located 500 kilometers southeast of Petra in Jordan lies an archaeological site of Hegra, also known as Madain Sale in Arabic language. Hegra is the first UNESCO World Heritage Site of Saudi Arabia declared in the year 2008 with over 130 remarkably well-preserved tombs set in the desert landscape as a site of patrimony. This was chosen for its well-preserved remains of ancient antiquity, especially the 131 monumental tombs cut into a rock mountain with their elaborately ornamented facades of Nabataean Kingdom during the 1st century AD. So, hello guys to the girls' mountain. Did you hear the, did you hear the, sto did you hear the story in the bus about the Nabataean? Where they came from? Yeah, so they were first Bedouin and they developed to become a settlement and they settled first in Jordan, in Petra, and then they expand and they came here. So these are the connections? Yes. Connections for uh, Yes, Jordan? it's the same civilization. The Dan? No, it's before the Dan. Be after the Dan. Okay? Yes, so the uh, the Danaids used to bury themselves in the mountain. This is extra now because the idea developed. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Napatian believe in the afterlife and they have a belief if they bury themselves in mountain, they will be close to God and they will have an afterlife. That's why they always make sure to have their tombs in mountain. So these are tombs. If the person is rich, he will create something like this for himself and the family. If not, he will create a humble one. And if it's extremely poor, he only get a hole at the top of the mountain, and that's it. Okay? In Hegra, we have more than 100 integrated tombs like this. In this rock, on this mountain, we have 31 tombs. Most of them are belongs to women, that's why it's called the girls' mountain. Oh, the girls yeah, mountain. the girls' mountain. So, let's talk about the details now. Guys, can you see the steps at the top? Yeah. It's five yeah. steps on the right and on the left. It's called cross steps, it means way to God or heaven. Oh. So the Nabataean believe in the afterlife and they believe if someone buried, the soul will go through these steps to God directly or heaven. Oh, okay. After that there is a decoration called Kurnis. Have you ever been in Egypt? Yes. yes. It's similar to what you can find in the Egyptian temples. Yeah. Can you imagine? In such an isolated place in the Arabian Peninsula. Yes. So they only use this decoration for tombs. Okay, on the right and on the left you can see the two columns, which yes. are Roman columns. The crowd of the columns are in a pattern. So there is a mix of culture here. Why do you think that happened? Migrated. Yeah. Yeah, they migrated from yeah. one place to another. Exactly guys, because they were traders and actually because they were very open to this culture. So not only goods that travel, even the mythologies and the idea. Can you see there is something in the triangle? Okay, it's not clear here, but we're gonna see a lot of all coming. Snakes, it's a face of a woman and her hair is snakes. Ah, yes. Did you remind something? Medusa. Exactly, Medusa from Greek. We're gonna see more examples and it will be very clear, not this one, okay? So why she's here? She's here for protection and to prevent bad luck. Above Medusa directly, there is an eagle. The eagle always there because it represents their chief god, Dushara. So they used to worship different gods and goddesses. Dushara was the chief of them. He's a solar god. In Arabic, he's a shu'ra. A shu'ra is a star differentiate the days from the nights. Okay? There is always a flame written in the Nabatian language. It's called the fundamental inscription. 
give information about the facade, uh, who the king at that time, uh, who allowed to be buried inside. Sometimes, if the tomb is belonged to women, she would write curses for protection. For example, she would say, by the name of the Shara, I will curse anyone who take out a bone or a body out of my tomb as a protection. Ah, okay. The flower is always there because it represents immortality and eternal life of the roses. Oh, okay. Flower is woman. So what happens yeah. now that we're going to walk all this way and we're going to see different tombs. Okay. The styles of the tomb are different because it depends how much money, of course, they had at that time. If yeah, it's big, of course, they want rich. Grandeur, it, yeah. Yes. And they will use different elements. It depends on the beliefs. Hmm. Not all the time you're going to find the shut up. Sometimes you're going to find something else. Okay. If you have any questions, when you're watching, I'm here just for us. You all the questions. Okay, when we're done, we're going to the bus. But of course, guys, don't forget that we're not allowed to enter the bus. Okay. Nabataeans are ancient Arabic nomads who made their way to Al-Ula in Medina province as traders of incense, myrrh, and spices inhabited the city as the kingdom's second capital after Petra in the north. The Nabataean site of Hegra was built around a residential zone in its oasis during the 1st century AD. The sandstone outcroppings were carved to build the necropolis or cemetery. A total of four necropolis sites have survived which featured 131 monumental rock cut tombs spread out over 13.4 kilometers, many would inscribe Nabataean epigraphs on their facades, making it the largest open-air archaeological museum in the world. Non-monumental burial sites like this, totaling 2,000, are also part of the place. A closer observation of the facades indicates the social status of the buried person. The size and ornamentation of the structure reflect the wealth of that person. Some facades had plates on top of the entrances providing information about the grave owners, the religious system, and the masons who carved them. Most graves indicate military ranks and leading archaeologists speculate that the site might once have been an Abitian military base meant to protect the settlement's trading activities.
This mountain alone, or Kasal al Walad Necropolis, includes 31 tombs decorated with fine inscriptions as well as artistic elements like birds, human faces, and imaginary beings. This contains the most monumental of Raqqa tombs, including the largest facade measuring 16 meters high. And then we move to another site that is still part of Hegra and this is the Jabal al Quraimat necropolis which is located southwest. By the DNA, most of them were relatives. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Same relatives. We do that. So, what will happen here? <laughs> I, I, I heard once that they should be. It's only take two minutes, but I think it's very important to end the tour with it. And then it will be like your time in Al Khairma to take photo if you have any questions and so on. Okay? So, Hekra's tomb, tombs was open for, were open for years. Mm -hmm. So, you can imagine the things that could happen to the tombs. First, it's on the ancient trading roads, and then the Roman took the place in 106. So this ancient trading road will come alive again in the Islamic period because they used the same roads to go into Mecca and Medina. Mm -hmm. After that, they created Hijaz Roadway on the same roads. Okay. So what happens that all the tombs was open except one tomb in the Red Mountain. It was covered by sand, the whole entrance. Okay. So when the archaeologists were here, 2008 to 2015. They removed the sand and they found the only closed tomb in Hegra. And they found a skeleton for a lady. She was between 40 to 50. And she, uh, yeah, and we talk about 2,500 years from now. So, of course, they have the same mindset of the Egyptian. They want to preserve the body, but they use simple techniques. They use raisin, aromatic substances, like maybe more, maybe uh, frankincense, to cover the body and layers of fabric. The first one would be wall dyed in planet called Fuwa in Arabic to give like a red texture a red color and then the last one the second one would be linen and the last one would be leather and she that lady called Haina daughter of what she was wearing a necklace what do you think it's made of <laughs> you will be too far dates thank you yes she was wearing a necklace made of dates dates Tamar why do you think she was carrying the date with her like Blessing. Yes, maybe. Or maybe she was very deep. Okay. <laughs> maybe she will want to grow the banana tree in the afterlife. Or maybe she want to use it as a currency. Okay. That's our favorite. <laughs> okay. I will show you a picture of her now. And maybe uh, I can airdrop it to everyone later. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. This is the mountain before and after. Can you see? It was blocked completely. That's why we found her. Other tombs, it just been open. Mm -hmm. So where's that mountain? And where's the skeleton? In the Red Mountain. Mm -hmm. It's not part of it's the Red Mountain. Right? <laughs> it's part of because of its color. Yeah. Oh. And this is her. This is the skeleton. Where's the skeleton? Ah, this is skeleton. There is here. What's the height? No, 160. Uh, one meter. Six six. I'm going to share it, guys, with you. Yeah. Okay. okay.
After listening to the Lady Tour Guide, I've learned that this site of exceptional archaeology has 53 graves carved over a group of rocky blocks called the Koraimat Mountain. The prominent feature of this site is the diversity of decorative rock facades. The carved facades are remarkably uneven on one side, while the other side are largely devoid of decoration. And so if you are planning to visit Al Ula in the future, make sure to include Al Hegra on your bucket list. <laughs>